Well, I think Hildegard is relevant today both as a mystic and as a prophet. In terms of mysticism, she's so earth-centered and she's so uh, connecting the microcosm, the soul, if you will, the psyche with the macrocosm, the universe. She's so cosmic in her perspective. But this fits exactly with our quest today to connect our souls to the new cosmology, to get a bigger vision of things than just uh, nationalism or uh, the anthropocentric agenda. And her, her spirituality, her mysticism, of course, expresses itself in the arts so wonderfully. She's so multi-gifted in that regard, but that her response to her awakenings is expressed through profound music, through poetry, through letter writing, through uh, painting and uh, mandalas. She kind of covers the field. And then in terms of her prophetic work, of course, the prophet, as Rabbi Heschel says, is one who interferes. And she was uh, very much interfering with corruption in the church in her day. And God knows there's a lot of corruption in the church in our day. And she had the courage to criticize her own organization, her own tradition. And a lot of uh, church people today are in denial and don't want to critique. The fact that she wrote the Pope and told him that he was surrounded by injustice and that justice was uh, failing in his domain. The fact that she wrote bishops and archbishops and abbots and told them that they were being lazy and that they lacked the prophetic spirit and their priests lacked the prophetic spirit. and They were just kind of taking in uh, the adulation of the people but not uh, stirring anyone up, beginning with themselves. So I think in both those domains, as mystic and as prophet, Hildegard stands out as an amazing historical figure, but also as a contemporary model. And of course, the fact that she's a woman. And for that alone, she is a tremendous model for aspiring young people to um, find their voice and uh, develop it and uh, deepen their spiritual experience and then speak out and uh, not hold back. And for all that, I think she's to be both commended and emulated. I discovered that she really was active, artistically active and significantly active in 12 separate areas of human endeavor. And no, she was not a dilettante because the mystic and the prophetical dimensions made her go very, very deep. So I'm not sure I can remember all 12 offhand, but I, I, can, I can try. She, she is, first of all, an excellent theologian and um, a preacher. Her sermons are outstanding, they're fresh, they're unlike any that we've ever seen. She is a writer of the epistolary genre, a writer of historiography, a writer of hagiography, two, two volumes of saints. She um, is primarily a, a medical a writer and of course knew, learned all about nursing and pharmacology in connection with that. Um, she belongs to the history of iconography with the beautiful visions um, that she left us. It, it just, it, you know, it goes on and on. So I, what I would say is that I have loved, ev and music, I have loved every single one of those means of expression. I mean, the music is absolutely transporting and when, and very, and, and it's inimitable. And there's never been anything like that until Hildegard appeared in the 12th century. She is a complete innovator daring and audacious, um, and so much so that it, 800 years later, it, people, it's made a huge impact in our time. It didn't become irrelevant or boring. People absolutely love it, and there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of uh, pieces on the internet about her, about her music. So that's, her, that's a very beautiful, beautiful voice. The, the nuns used to say that they, nothing made them happier than when Hildegard would walk through the monastery uh, chanting one of the songs that she had written herself because she had such a beautiful, clear, bell-clear, crystal, high voice. Now, I just want to say a few words about this uh, opera, Ordo Virtutum, that we will be seeing something of uh, shortly. Ordo Virtutum. It means order of the virtues or play of the virtues. And so it's about the virtues. So there's uh, the characters in there are virtues. One virtue is modesty. One virtue is um, 
patience and so forth. And they go th and they all sing their songs and so forth. And of course, the devil's in there too. Now, the devil is a man. The virtues are all women, I might point out. But remember, she was operating in a women's monastery. Not originally. Originally, she was in a bisexual monastery because that's how the Celts did things. They were not all hung up on sex like the southern Europeans. So they had men and women living together in monasteries, and that's where Hildegard grew up. You know her story. I'm sure, I'm sure you've read that. I don't want to go into the obvious, where she was signed over by her parents as a tithe to the church. And at a very young age, I think seven, she joined this um, abbess, well, this uh, hermitess, who later was made abbess. In this bon monastery, it was a men and women monastery. And then when this abbess died, they elected Hildegard, the abbess, to replace her. So um, she spent, you know, from the age of seven, uh, all that time in, uh, in uh, either studying spirituality with this hermit or being in the Benedictine the abbey, abbey. But it was a bisexual abbey. But when she wrote her first book, Shivyas, which means know the ways, she, S-C-I, know vias, the ways, vi, vi, vias, the ways, as in via positiva, know the ways. Ooh, wow, I never thought of that. There we go, this applies to us, doesn't it, in none of the four ways. Her first book was so popular, the Pope gave it a, uh, a recommendation. Back in those days, that sold your book. Today, if the Pope condemns your book, it sells your book. So anyway, <laughs> history changes. But anyway, um, the book became very popular because it got out there. These women students came flocking to the monastery and said, we want to study with Hildegard. This is some lady, we want to study with Hildegard. And there wasn't any more room in the women's section of the monastery, but there was in the men's. But the men wouldn't move over and let more women in. So Hildegard didn't sit around feeling sorry for herself. She got up, took all her nuns with her and their dowries, and left D.C. Bodenberg, which is where they were, D.C. Bodenberg, and started her own place up the river. Well, we have letters from the abbot back in the monastery saying, please come back. Come back, bring those women with you, and bring their dowries too. And, she, and her letter back to him is all about justice and injustice. She took one man with her, Volmar, who was her secretary. See, men make good secretaries, but they have to be asked. And um, <laughs> in fact, he's, oh yeah, he's in one of the pictures. And he plays the devil in her opera. In her opera, uh, Volmar is, plays the devil, and he talks. He doesn't sing. The virtues sing. The devil does not sing, and that's part of her feeling, that music, she says music is life, trinity, she says you are music. Music is God talking to us. So she thinks it takes a pure soul to sing. We have to remember that she was a nun in a, in a community, and that their basic spiritual practice was to chant the office, which is the Psalms, uh, several times a day. And, uh, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> living busily in the world. So that's not really that translatable. However, uh, her, and then to her music, is um, this powerful uh, Gregorian chant. And uh, we've had people sing it, students sing it, and when you do, you literally hyperventilate. You get high because it requires so much breath, so much air to reach all the notes. So it's a very uh, clever tactic on her part to get her nuns high and uh, experiencing transcendence uh, through the physiology of music. Again, I think that that's translatable insofar as um, uh, musically inclined people uh, want to sing today as in any generation, and, but to, to sing in the context of realizing that it is a form of meditation, it is a form of spiritual discipline and practice. It's a yoga, the yoga of sound. And then to her, her painting, her painting of her mand mandalas and her visions, this too is a centering process, art is meditation, that um, people can derive a lot of uh, spiritual maturity by doing. She also was very active physically, I believe, even though her health was not real good. But by that I mean that she, I think she did a lot of walking, as people did in, in those days, on these various trips of hers. And um, 
I think she kind of took care of herself that way. But um, she also studied, uh, did a lot of study of science and of theology and this whole tradition that reading scripture and reading theology is a spiritual practice. Uh, and, and she broadened that to include science too. She said, all science comes from God. So um, the whole idea that study is a spiritual discipline is also very translatable today. Obviously more so than her day because books are far more plentiful. Remember that she lived long before the printing press. And obviously she was very close to nature. I mean, her nuns were growing uh, vines and wine, making wine, as they still are in this day. And um, of course her, her period of history, the vast majority of citizens were uh, working the land. And the whole spiritual relationship you have with the land, the seasons, the uh, plants, which uh, play such a big role in her awareness and with the animals. Uh, remember, she was trained in a Celtic monastery, so animals too, along with the vegetation and plants, were a very important part of her, her spiritual uh, awareness. She had to find a way to speak because women were not allowed to speak in church. And there's a, a famous line from Paul that no woman should ever have authority over a man. So for her to speak out was amazingly daring um, and adventuresome and risky. She got around that by saying that the Holy Spirit and, uh, inspired her and God made her do it. Um, but there, was, there were huge obstacles to be overcome to get over that. She had to, she was a very good politician, she had to enlist the power of Bernard of Claveau, of the bishop here, the, the pope there, the Holy Roman Emperor, and she won all these people over to her side um, just so that she would be silenced and she could you know, say what she wanted to say. What other forces? Um, well, the forces of jealousy coming right from other, other um, women who didn't want her to have an opportunity to do this if they couldn't have it. Um, and she did, she did deal with that. And she, and she dealt remarkably because this is another one of her famous areas about anger. Um, she said that too often if there was a case of jealousy, a pr one person would fall on another in anger. And she absolutely did not want that to happen. She wanted the person to be dealt with, um, with patience and, um, and, with and with love and kindness. She said that, you know, one form of evil is to harm the soul of another person. And when we get angry at one another, we do harm each other's soul. There's a lot of what I would call deep ecumenism in, in Hildegard, conscious or unconscious. Uh, she's obviously crossing um, ethnic boundaries when she paints uh, Adam as a red man and um, she paints the head of God as a red head with eagle feathers. Obviously she is being deeply influenced by the Native American tradition because having grown up in a Celtic monastery she heard stories of the Celts who had come to America long before Columbus and brought these stories back of the red people. She also paints Aztec heads in at least one of her paintings. But also there's deep Hindu influence in her, in her um, imagery. And again, this is connected to her Celtic uh, tradition, I believe, because uh, the Celts and the Hindus have a lot in common and many scholars believe the Celts came from India. And so her um, teaching of the ropes of the universe, for example, that bind things together is very Celtic. Her love of sound as being the basis of all spiritual practice is very, very Hindu. Uh, Hindus say in the beginning was the sound. And she actually connects that explicitly to the word in the Christian tradition. So, um, and as a musician, I think, I think her music is absolutely primal for her. It is the number one spiritual experience she undergoes, the experience of vibration, sound, and music. And so, um, again, that is very, very Hindu. But also, uh, I would say there are deep elements of Buddhism in her teaching as well. 
her teaching of the, what we would call the cosmic Christ today, of how the Word of God or the being of God, uh, the God's presence is present in, um, in all creatures. Uh, the Christ is present in all creatures. This absolutely parallels the Buddhist teaching that the Buddha nature is present in the flower and in the tree and in the clouds and in the smile of a baby. But the fact is, whenever you get a deep mystic um, in any tradition, an authentic mystic, I think that that spiritual experience is going to tap into the uh, deep archetypes and uh, language and symbols of other traditions with people who have had their spiritual experiences. There are really only so many words, you might say, so many uh, languages and symbols and metaphors for our deepest experiences of wonder and awe and unity and ecstasy and grief and dark night of the soul. And so mystics really do talk a common language. I write about this in my book, One River, Many Wells, using my Strachart's image of God as a great underground river with all these different wells that go in. So Hildegard's tapping into the Celtic well and she's tapping into the Hindu well as well as the Christian well. But by going down her well, She's also um, unveiling the, what happens in a Buddhist well, too. Just for example, the phrase, um, the Buddha mind, is about uh, you know, enlarging our, the scope of our, our heart's desire. And she has wonderful images about that, for example, about the house of wisdom that is all of ours, that we need to explore and to deepen. So um, you have in Hildegard a very real mystic and therefore a very ecumenical mystic. Hildegard is first and foremost um, a Catholic Christian. She, uh, if you stop and think about it, she um, took religious vows at 14, was raised by an aunt who was kind of a hermit nun, and a lot of her education came from Christian psalms and hearing the liturgy and Christian books, the, the inspiring writers from Christianity from the first thousand years of history, and, um, and the Bible itself. So she was steeped. She, her, little, her little, the cell of the two women was adjoined a male monastery, and they, so this was her world. So Christianity is uh, in her heart and blood, the marrow of her bones, um, in all ways. But there are lots of universal insights in Christianity where there's an incredible overlapping, and it's primarily, really among all the world's great religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Islam, uh, and of course um, the more spiritual offshoots like Sufism and all the indigenous religions too. The, the overlaps are, relate to the mystical experience to the intense spiritual experience that comes in prayer and meditation. And I've actually been to conferences with a hundred different religions represented. And I've seen, I've seen the experience of um, people getting into fights over when they went to stock, talk about doctrine. I, I won't mention any specific religions, but I can remember um, seeing a, a person in a certain type of costume drawing a sword um, because they were in such a great dispute. But the minute you get them talking about um, spiritual experience, everybody relates. And then the doctrines, the ideas ha don't mean anything. It's you tell me, I tell you yours, and you're going to tell me your experience. And that is absolutely universal. And I know one, um, B. Griffiths, as a matter of fact, used to say the, that these religions are kind of like your, your hand, that each of the fingers represents one of the great religions. And there's separation between them in space and distinction. But when you look at the root of those fingers, at the real truth, uh, in terms of our experience and divine truth, they're all one. They're all one. Um, so Hildegard certainly uh, had intuitions that you'll find in all the religions. The, I doubt very much that she studied the others, but um, certainly in anything that has to do with spiritual practice, prayer, and meditation, she would be in accordance with other religions. Now, she also, chant was one of her favorite 
um, spir spiritual practices, and of course that has much to do with Hinduism, Native American, and so many other schools. So um, she, she would have gotten along very, very well with anyone in any religion. One of the main sources of Hildegard's um, theology is, of course, wisdom scripture, that is the Psalms, which as a Benedictine she's saying every day, several times a day. And the wisdom literature of Israel, of the Hebrew Bible, is, um, is very feminist, and it's very earthy and cosmological. We're told that wisdom uh, walks the vaults of the sky, and she walks on the sands of the deep. So she's, she's walking all over the edges <laughs> of the universe. And she is present wherever there's creativity, and she's present uh, wherever there is, is nature. Now, it's interesting, in our day, the, the Jesus Seminar scholars are rediscovering how the historical Jesus was thoroughly a part of this wisdom tradition. That was his, his uh, basis of his spirituality. All this is creation spirituality. Uh, and, and Hildegard is, is thoroughly immersed in it. And that's what makes her theology so creation-centered and therefore so grounded. Because wisdom theology does not look first to the Bible. It doesn't look first to human books. It looks first to nature itself and the unfolding of nature. And um, uh, Hildegard is this way, and the historical Jesus was that way. And uh, again, this is good medicine for the Bibleolatry that drives so many fundamentalist uh, movements in our time. Uh, Hildegard, like the historical Jesus, uh, looks on nature itself as a revelation of God. And a century after Hildegard, St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the great geniuses of, of Western philosophy and theology, said this, he said, Revelation comes in two volumes, nature and the Bible. Now Hildegard knew this, uh, and she listened to the revelation of nature and to what she called the Word of God speaking through all creatures. And she says every creature has an internal life, an interior life. Well, that's an amazing statement. Every mountain, every river, every tree, every atom. Now that puts her in perfect communion with Hinduism, with Buddhism, and with Native American spirituality. And, of course, with an ecological consciousness. So in that, from that point of view, she's way ahead of contemporary Christians, most of whom are ignorant of creation spirituality, ignorant of the very wisdom tradition that infused the historical Jesus. And, uh, and, and a church that is still lagging way behind in terms of uh, offering spiritual leadership around the ecological issues of our time, which are the real, uh, most fundamental moral issues of our time. If Hildegard had been a man, she still would have had a wonderful um, impact. Um, but he would not have been quite as dazzling a figure because there'd been lots of others like him. I mean, certainly through the whole Middle Ages, you'd, you'd seen astonishing people, you know, from, from the, well, 500 years before Jesus, the Buddha, and then Jesus, Mohammed emerged in 500 years after Jesus. So, and you'd had brilliant scientists. And so we have, from the 4,000 years of recorded history of men's lives, we have, a, we have awesome achievement in every area of life. So clearly, Hild, Hildegard, as a man, would not have been um, so striking. And... And yet the thought, if Hildegard, in, a, in another way, could have been a man, how much more she could have done. And because she could have gotten out of the monastery much, much more easily. She didn't get out until she was 62 years old. And of course, there's a wonderful message in this about, for, for our elders, that uh, Hildegard's, you know, got, got, life got going at the age of 42. And her best decade was clearly her 70s, you know, and she died at 82. She did all her work in those 40 years. Um, so there's that great message on that. Um, on, the, on the male question, what would she have done? 
she would certainly have not have stayed in that little cell with her Aunt Yuta um, for 20 years um, being bossed by Yuta. She, I'm sure, a man would have said, I'm sorry, Aunt Yuta, but I really have big things to do and would have wanted to go on an adventurous trip around Europe. <laughs> or he would have gone on the crusade. You know, there was, there was a, Hildegard actually preached the second crusade, which is another strange thing about Hildegard. So he would have gone on a crusade or he would have, he had, you know, very big, might, he might have wanted to become pope. Um, or or a, a cl clergy one way for a man in those very classist societies um, was to emerge by joining the military or joining the um, uh, politics in, in the sense of um, trying to work for the king and work your way up. And maybe you could get knighted in the military. You might have honors. And so he could rise up and become very important. Um, he also could get a spectacular education. There, you know, the great universities were, ri were arising then, Bologna and Paris and all of these. And see, women, women couldn't even, weren't even get a primary education, let alone a university or a specialist education like a doctor. So if she, this great soul, um, with her unbelievable giftedness and her faith, her, her, no, her knowing God because of the vi visions, I mean, what might she have done? Would she have gone to the medical school at Bologna? Would she have, you know, gotten a great degree in Paris? Would she have joined the middle, the, uh, the army? Would she have been another, um, I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> the imagination can go anywhere with that question. <laughs> but I, I often think, um, you know, Rumi, how do you, how do you surpass someone like Rumi? That's, and we've had a lot of people with that level of genius. We simply haven't had many women like that. You know, it's been very valuable to be able to share a Hildegard with others, and especially women. I remember once I was showing her slides at a women's conference. And afterwards, a woman came up and she said, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. She said, I have three teenage daughters and I'm a Catholic. And she said, you know, I've told them about Mary, but Mary didn't do all that much. I can hardly wait to go home and tell them about Hildegard. Here's Hildegard, who was a healer and a painter and a musician and an artist and a, and a prophet who took on the church hierarchy. And, and she was a woman. She said, here's a woman who I can tell my daughters about. And, I thought about that because I, I don't have daughters and I realized well, how important that is, that young people have models of, um, that they can identify with and the fact that Hildegard uh, really played out the message of Jesus in such a full way is a um, is very, good, very good source for uh, mo modeling and mentoring uh, other generations. So um, I know it's been a, a gift for me to be able to um, point out to, to women that there were these strong voices in, uh, in Western and even Christian history and therefore don't hold back uh, on your speaking today, and of course, it doesn't hurt for men to hear these things either. Hmm. But simply the beauty that she brings, her music is, um, is so transcendent and, and, and yet earthy, so passionate, consensual, erotic, and spiritual, that she demonstrates that eros and spirit are not at odds. I think that's something that our whole culture needs to rediscover. In some ways, I'd say that the wild, she's a wild woman, precisely in Dr. Clarice Nicola Estes' understanding of it. And um, she gives permission for the rest of us to entertain the wild nature that, to me, is parallel with the sacred. Because what is sacred and what is awesome is wild. It's not domesticated and you can't tame it and you can't lock it up in church or any other system and this is what every authentic mystic I think uh, tastes and responds to and um, Hildegard the very fact that she was excommunicated and interdicted at 81 with her other nuns 81 years of age demonstrates that you know this 
the wildness of this lady did not go into retirement. And uh, I wish we had a lot more elders in our culture today who um, did not see retirement as uh, passing their lives on golf courses, but saw it as criticizing power where it needs criticizing, which is exactly what Hildegard was doing. And befriending the young, which is exactly what got Hildegard in trouble there when she was 81, uh, burying a young man who was a revolutionary on her property. So the, the pressing need in our societies today for um, wise elders and um, who can communicate with the younger generation, uh, this is so important especially because the media is, um, is not run by elders. Uh, that is, it's not run by people striving to be wise. It's run by people striving to, to get rich and to represent the corporations that are, by definition, engines of greed. And this taints all the information that comes to us through the media. It taints our souls. And young people grow up immersed in this world of the media, run by greed so often, and not immersed in the world of, uh, of uh, what elders can teach us, a world of wisdom. Hildegard gives so much to our times. She, first of all, it's the revelation of the beauty of the soul. And we've just been through a century where some people are now saying there was only one great war. It began in 1913 and, and it ended when the uh, Berlin Wall came down. And, and now we're starting another war. But within that and through it and despite it, there is blinding beauty in the human soul. The soul does not get harmed by disease and by evil. The soul lives forever. It's immortal. And its, its ground is love. Its ground is, um, is all these good virtues that Hildegard talks about, the patience and the beauty, um, and the goodness. And I, th I think that is um, communicated when we even, if, again, if we just talk about it, it's communicated in life. And we need to hear that message so much. Everybody is beautiful. Everybody's eyes are shining. Um, the, the, the soul at its bottom is flooded with grace, and we can't get away from that no matter what we do. If we do something, if we, and we're walking a path, she's, Hildegard's first book is Know the Way, Scivious, Know the Way, Know the Way to Walk. She also says we fall off, um, and it, you wouldn't think that our souls were all those pure and holy and beautiful, but we do find our way back on. And that's, again, Hildegard always says you have a choice. You are responsible, you have a choice. Um, choose health or choose death, choose life or choose death, choose to have your hand burned in the fire or choose um, quenching water. Um, she also has a message for our time in, in ecology, you know, because she is a forerunner that's with astonishing perspicacity and prophetic insight into uh, pollution problems. and. I, I think that's what people talk about more than anything is the greening power that she saw in life and how she looked at the greening, um, the green things around her in the Rhineland and saw that this was, this was the very essence of life. This was the divine. This is the light and the love in, that is reality. Reality is the shimmering light that we see in things. So that's a huge area uh, to make us cherish and love these things and, and just feel heartbroken when a species disappears. She would. Um, she, women, women, of course, women's leadership is another huge area that she um, fosters in, in life today. And in fact, leadership for everyone, to, just to take spiritual leadership and um, try to just um, and make, make the, the life sparkle and shine with, with uh, talk about divine things. Uh, we don't talk about God anymore. And, uh, and she would say, that just talking about it will make a difference. People will start thinking about it. Um, 
I think the gifts for her t for our time is is the nature of spiritual practice that she that is so palatable and pleasant for everyone. She isn't saying you have to be on your knees in church every day, or you have to do your Easter duty, or you have to do penance, or all these awful things. She's she's finding a spirituality that people love. Um, on <laughs> she did something that was really wild. Uh, her sisters, you know, wore a black, completely long black habit. And Hildegard to, um, decided to try to get across to them their idea of the nobility and regal quality of the human soul the, um, that Meister Eckhart talks about so much. She would allow them on feast days to have dress-up days. So they had dress-down days and dress-up days. And on dress-up days, she let them wear gold bracelets, and they could wear a gold circlet around their head and with some symbols of, of the Lamb of God and this kind of thing. And most of all, you know, the nuns always had long hair and just pulled it up, and it was under this big, long veil. Well, on their feast days, they, could, they took off that veil, and their hair was allowed to, to flow. And they wore a, just a, a very light, long, uh, translucent, transparent, white silk veil on these feast days so that they could just feel like the Queen of Heaven. And... Um, she, and she said that their, um, their glory was in their hair, whereas everybody else was saying hair was just a temptation for, for men. You had to cut it off. You had to hide it. You know, you have to put on your burqa so nothing can be seen. Hildegard said, no, dress up and be beautiful and reflect your own soul. It's true that Hildegard exhorts. You know, she is a preacher, and she exhorts, and she's trying to call people into a, um, an awakening. I think she wants people to wake up, and she does. She says that. She says, oh, human, why are you so dull? Why are you so asleep? Wake up. So I think that might be her, her primary message. And waking up to what? Waking up to the wonder of our existence, the wonder of our bodies. She's very explicit about that. It's another thing that distinguishes her from most theologians of the past is that... Um, she is so body conscious. Her commentary on John 1, the prologue in John's Gospel, is actually built around, around all uh, the, uh, the limbs and the organs of the body. It's really quite amazing. And she calls there, for, if you will, for a reintegration of the sense of flesh and spirit. She's not like Augustine and all the other platonically tainted uh, male theologians of the church are uh, ill at ease with flesh, she actually celebrates it. And she celebrates how God, in the Incarnation story, took on human flesh. So um, she has so much to teach us in terms of balance. But for her, balance is not about balancing out. It's not about being quiet. There's an energy to her, an exuberance uh, that... Uh, always comes through, and, and you especially feel it in her music. Uh, she, she is about revibrating, <laughs> re-energizing, and therefore awakening the very cells of our bodies, saying nothing of the cells of our minds and uh, our spirits. So I think that's perhaps her, her basic message. And... Uh, for humans to re rediscover how we are an amazing species and that all of creation is in a way patterned in us. And of course, this is today's science too, that we have inherited the atoms from the rest of the universe and the minds of, if you will, the brain, certainly, of ancient uh, reptiles and uh, mammals. And it's, there's a lot in us that has been borrowed <laughs> from billions of years of evolution. And while she, of course, was not conscious of the billions of years, she was very uh, evolutionary in her consciousness. Uh, she saw things unfolding. In fact, she says um, time and again, she says, humans are here to assist the, the cosmos in its unfolding. And she paints the cosmos as an, an egg, an incipient being that has to grow up. And she says, humans are here to help the universe grow up. But of course, to do that, we have to grow up. We have to become more aware and, uh, and more responsible. And that's what all morality is about. And she calls humans to uh, ethical action.
the right relationships. And that, frankly, is one of her phrases, right relationships. And she warns us that if we cannot write in our relationships and live in justice, not only with one another, but with the other creatures on the planet, that creation itself, she says, will punish us. Not some god avenging us in the sky, not some peeping Tom divinity in our bedroom window, but that creation, which is, as she says, a web, will not tolerate any species that uh, is so arrogant that it sets itself apart from the web, the community. And of course, exactly what she wrote about is literally happening today with the warming of the planet and the, um, the loss of the soil and the waters and the forests and the ozone covering and so forth. It's creation that is um, uh, telling us that we're on the wrong path. She certainly was a person ahead of her time, uh, above time, beyond time, outside time, and yet heavily and solidly within, within time. Her feet were planted in the ground. And I've often thought of her, um, of her spirituality as, as, in fact, I've called that in places a political spirituality because it was absolutely essential to her to be engaged in the politics of her time. It wasn't enough to stay home and stay in and chant and uh, work and write and do these things. She had to make a difference, as we have to make a difference in society. And she found remarkable ways to do it. Um, for instance, when oh, there are so many instances, let me take this one because she was um, 81 and the, uh, she, had re she had buried a person allowed a person to be buried on her grounds who some churchmen felt had been ex excommunicated and didn't deserve a Catholic burial. And Hildegard fought for him to the point that when they came to exhume him, she covered up the grave and no one could find it. Um, but then, in retaliation for that, the Archbishop of Mainz slapped an interdict on her uh, convent. And an interdict means that the um, sisters, and this, this is 80 women, were deprived of all music. They could not listen to it, chant, have anything, which meant they couldn't sing the liturgy. And then in addition to that, they um, couldn't receive communion. So this was like the food and nourishment of their entire lives. This was their soul life. Um, how could they go on without that? That's the heart, especially with the Benedictines. That is the heart of the liturgy, music and the Eucharist. So Hildegard wouldn't stand for it. And letters went back and forth. And finally, in the last year of her life, in fact, this is the spring of her, of her life, she walked to Mainz, which is, you know, an old woman close to death, um, prob and walked probably something like six hours. And heaven knows what the weather was. And she got there, and she, she spoke out and told them that music is the voice of God. And you can't take that away from people. The soul life just can't blossom, and people can't be their full selves um, if they don't have music. And she wrote a document, a magnificent document, on, like a defense of music, and gave it to him and persuaded him. And he let her go home and looked at the, the interdict. And um, just a couple of weeks after she got home, she died. 